The first kindred society structure that needs to be understood is the Camarilla. As the most prevalent sect, a vampire from the Camarilla is the most likely one is to encounter. To understand what Camarilla is, first it must be understood that Camarilla are not the good guys. They are not here to protect humans from other monstrous vampires and other supernatural creatures. They are here to protect themselves from all others who are not among them and especially the humans who could by sheer number wipe them from the face of the earth. The Camarilla's single greatest creation, the Masquerade, exists for that purpose. With veil of misdirection and falsehood, Camarilla hides the very fact of kindred existence from the mortal world. It hides itself like wolf among the sheep. What Camarilla really is about is the preservation of the status quo. A way for elder vampires to protect themselves from each other and keep their power, thus their immortal existence. The eldest like having control over thousands of younger kindred and waves and waves of subordinates to protect them. They make policies that keep the things as they are and exactly as they want. The Camarilla works, at least for the ones who make the policy decisions. Even those kindred positioned lower in the power structure want the things to stay the same. Camarilla offers a buffer against the harsh winds of change. Many kindred who are a relic of ages long past, having no place in the modern world, have a vested interest to keep the things as they are. In theory, Camarilla is the universal organization of vampires that speaks for and legislates for every vampire in the world. Bound by its laws known as the traditions, Camarilla is open to any vampire regardless of its clan or origin. In truth, Camarilla is far from universal. Of the 13 clans, 6 pledge their allegiance, 1 has abandoned them and 2 are in direct opposition. And that not being enough, Camarilla shakes from the strife within itself. But regardless of being beset from foes within and without, Camarilla is still the largest, strongest and the most populous sect of vampires in the world. It still controls much of Americas, has inroads in Far East and rules almost all of Europe. In practice Camarilla is a sect of cities and the faction as a whole is ruled by inner circle, though very few outside its body ranks know who, what or how large that circle might be. There are rumors that they are the founding fathers of their children, but no one knows for certain. The inner circle meets every 13 years to appoint Justicars, who then serve as the ruling council agents in the field for the next cycle. Justicars appoint Archons to assist in their work and thus the internal policing of the sect is assured. The vast majority is not in this ruling top and is more concerned with the nightly business of whatever metropolis they call home. Every Camarilla city has its prince who is advised by the council of elders called the Primogen. Beneath the prince there is a vast array of officers who maintain order, keep the traditions and squabble to attain more power in this political pyramid. Even more, most of the city's vampires, especially the younger ones, are just pawns in power games coordinated by their elders. These movers and shakers of the Camarilla are very old, centuries and even millennia old. They have seen the rise and falls of empires, philosophies and utopias and have moved on unchanged. Their presence anchors the Camarilla firmly in its place. At the same time, there are more younger vampires than ever before, who are hungry for power and tired of being used in the schemes of their elders. Power is the currency of the Camarilla, and the struggle for it has spread on every corner of its territory. The prime benefit of vampiric condition is immortality, and if one is not being careful, he can lose it very easily. That is why vampires wage their wars over decades and even centuries using their pawns and other kindred, while personally avoiding conflict. No vampire wants to risk a boundless future by brawling on the streets with their swords and powers unless it is the last resort. They fight for control and dominance using their vast resources, lies, plots and intrigues. Almost all Camarilla vampires are urban creatures and the basic population ratio is one vampire for every 100,000 mortals, although that number may vary in some places. Socially, Camarilla is an exceedingly polite society, with bloodshed outlawed and carefully watched for. Saloons, elysiums, meetings and deal cutting, all of these are part of nightly social structure for the sex kindred. 
Before we get deeper within the structure of the Camarilla, we need to explain some terms in order to avoid confusion at a later date. Blood bond is the supernatural love created by the act of ingesting a kindred's vitae three times. Bonds can rarely be broken, especially if they are periodically reinforced with more vitae. Diablerie, also called Amaranth, is the act of consuming all Vitae from another kindred and drawing his soul into one's own. Needless to say, that kindred receives final death and the consumer absorbs his powers. Also, if one should Diablerize a vampire of a lower generation, she will lower his own generation. Generation is the number of steps between the undead and the mythical Cain, who is reputedly the father of all vampires, being a vampire of first generation. Antediluvians are members of the third generation of vampires, rumored to be founders of the currently existing plants. The study of vampiric history is the most curious one, because in comparison to mortal historians, vampires have witnessed the events themselves. Although their recollection is painted with their own perspective, personal wishes and agendas. It is known all too well that victors write history and probably there are many events that have occurred differently than they are told and described. However, nearly all kindred agree upon certain events and facts. The kindred of the Camarilla trace their sects past from the roots in the Renaissance. The history of the Camarilla has been shaped by three constant conflicts. The struggle of the elders to retain their power and keep the younger ones below them and on their side the eternal risk of rediscovery by the Kine, and the war between Camarilla and the Sabbath. The Camarilla's roots date back to a crucial event in 1381, a revolt by mortal peasants in England against the local nobility, and these mortals were aided by freedom-loving kindred of many clans. Kindred historians specifically point to an attack on the Ventru Hardestad by the Bruja Anarch Tyler as the starting point of the Anarch Revolt. Although the peasant revolt was soon put down, the spark of revolution was spread among the young vampires throughout the Western Europe. Oppressed children rose against their sires and others took advantage of the chance to gain more power and commit diablerie. The Anarchs, emboldened by the Tyler's success, staged a terrifying coup and destroyed the La Sombra Antediluvian and claimed to have destroyed the Zamitia Antediluvian as well. Rebels even discovered how to break blood bonds and even coordinated their attacks with Esamites who were more than happy to assist for the chance to commit. In 1435, Hardestad called a convocation of elders to deal with the honor problem. He proposed a league of vampires to be formed to address the problem that crossed territorial and clan lines. Only a small group joined in the beginning, but over the next decade this group pushed the idea of the Camarilla more subtly. By 1450, the founders of the Camarilla had enough support from European elders and began to assert their authority and attacked Anarch strongholds. The centralized power of the Camarilla seemed to have been the key to defeat the Anarchs and in 1493 leaders of the Anarch movement acquiesced to the Camarilla's demand for a convention to discuss the terms of their surrender. The Convention of Thorns brought most of the Anarchs back to the Camarilla and arranged the punishment of the Esamite clan for their role in the revolt. Toreador Rafael de Corazon in his public speech demanded the enforcement of the traditions with the masquerade. Those Anarchs who rejected the terms of the Convention of Thorns fled later to form the Sabbat. Though the newly formed Sabbat waged a war on the Camarilla in Europe, the discovery of the New World opened opportunities and became the real chessboard for war between these two sects. Elders of the Camarilla sent their more troublesome children and many Antilaya saw an opportunity to grab their own turf without waiting for their immortal masters to die. Thus, colonization of the New World began. Camarilla staked the English, Dutch and French territories while Sabat influenced Spain and Portugal colonies. The 17th and 18th century were a time of retrenchment and reinforcement of the Camarilla, but that did little to change the struggle with Sabat. Industrialization moved more people into the cities and opened new avenues of power for kindred. The War of 1812 concealed an all-out war for control of the Atlantic seaboard between the Sabat and the Camarilla. 
And American Camarilla lost the East Coast and from that point forward marked the time of constant slow-paced conflict wage on smaller avenues. At the beginning of the 20th century, when empires grew calcified, the sects influenced, manipulated and exploited the events and conflicts of mortals in order to attain more power and to inflict damage on one another. Numerous forces conspired to take control over Europe during the devastating depression left after the Great War. But none could nudge the European kindred society enough before the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany. Wise kindred got out of the way and let kind fight their war. Foolish kindred tried to direct the tides of war and usually got crushed under it. The post-war boom was good for the United States and benefited the American kindred. The American anarchs took the advantage of war's chaos to gain their own territory in the west coast. Today things are changing too quickly for elders eye to follow. The return of Hong Kong to China means that Camarilla lost its only toehold in East Asia and there are rumors that Cathayan vampires may be making a move on the American Pacific coast. Quiet war rages along the East Coast as Camarilla tries to retake its old territories and prevent Sabat from expanding. Only in Europe, things remain relatively static for the kindred as the elders there have long since learned how best to keep control no matter the changes to kind society, although there is an ever-rising pressure from the Middle East. The inner circle is the unobserved model of the secret masters that so many conspiracy theories speak of. It is the ruling ring of the Camarilla. The very eldest of elders gather every 13 years and discuss the sect's future and current business. During this time they appoint justicars and consider and determine the Camarilla's direction for the next 13 years. Who is within the inner circle is one of the Camarilla's best kept secrets. Supposedly they are the eldest of their clans, but that is open for debate. The secrecy is part of tradition and security especially. After the assassination of the Justicar Petrodon, the inner circle realized that they are the ultimate prize and they take no chances with their immortal unlives. The Justicars are the eyes, ears, hands and sometimes fists of the inner circle. Each Justicar represents his own clan and therefore there are six Justicars, considering that the gun girl had left the fold. Rumor has it that the former Justicar Xavier, rather than to stand for re-election before the inner circle, merely walked into their presence, uttered a single sentence and then turned his back on both the council and the sect. What was that sentence remains the topic of many debates. There was no formal resignation of allegiance nor ceremony of departure. The Gangrel elders simply decided that belonging in the Camarilla is no longer in their best interest. Appointment of Justicars is a long drawn out process as each clan fights to place a strong member in perhaps the most powerful position that any kindred can hold. Often compromised candidates are chosen, but sometimes truly deserving, powerful and dedicated vampires ascend to the position of Justicar. Justicars enjoy immense power in the kindred society. They may call a conclave at any time and they alone have the ultimate power to adjudicate matters involving the traditions and do so on a grand level. When they make even a polite request, few kindred dare to refuse it as they are regarded with awe and fear. They stride the Camarilla like Colossi and the shadow they cast is very long indeed. The Archons are the minions of the Justicars, set to act in their names as no Justicar can be everywhere at once. Archons are there to make certain that the Justicar's presence is felt. They are chosen from the ranks of promising Ankylae and younger vampires. Their position lasts as long as their employer wish to retain them and with the new Justicar there can be appointed new Archon. Not every Archon appears officially and with their mission in hand. Justicars often need watchers and quiet workers and the best ones simply appear, do their job and live with as little fanfare as possible. Those were the positions in the Camarilla hierarchy as a whole and next ones are positioned in any given Camarilla city. Ostensibly the prince is the Camarilla's voice in the city he rules, responsible for keeping the peace, enforcing the laws and making the city safe from incursion. Originally the position began with the strongest vampire claiming the domain over a given region and over time the position reached its familiar modern form during the renaissance. 
The elders ensure that the prince's reign is maintained in the name of stability, and as long as he does his duties without bothering their agendas, he will remain in his position. The primogen is the assembly of elders in a given city, and each clan has at least one representative. No one seems quite certain when the primogen body came into being, but whatever it came from, the primogen council continues into the present nights as clan leaders, filling the seats of remarkable power. Primogen council is meant to be a, the legislative body, a representation of opinions of various clans with regard to the governance of their city. That is true in very few cities. Those primogen who are seated in many cities are more like an old vampire's club, a nest of nepotism, favor trading, threats and treachery. The primogen can hold a great deal of power and can dictate the rules of the game in the city with prince constantly fighting, arguing and threatening them back into line. On the other hand, there are some powerful princes in whose cities council meets solely at his whim. The whip is not an official position within the hierarchy of the Camarilla, but rather a recent phenomenon that seemed based almost solely in countries with democratic legislature. Even the most organized primogen can be overworked, and that is where the whip comes in. Whip can be very useful and is often a kindred who is of some influence within his clan, so he will be listened to. Sometimes the position is not a reward, but a way to keep the potential troublemaker close at bay. As for the responsibilities of this position, it is the same as the one in mortal politics. In the mortal world, the seneschal was the keeper of the keys in a noble house, the minder of affairs, the one who always knew what was happening and the one who was closest to the master's ears. Also, the seneschal was in charge of the estate when the master was away. In vampiric world, the position hasn't changed much. The seneschal is the prince's personal assistant, the one who knows what is going on at any given moment. The Primogen Council chooses the Seneschal to their locking, but princes insist that the choice is there to make, often pointing out the Nuremberg incident in 1836 when a Sabbat spy managed to achieve this post and the city narrowly avoided being completely overrun. The Seneschal is almost never the same clan as the Prince because that would be a disaster waiting to happen. The position of Seneschal can be a completely thankless one, always being under the shadow of a prince and one of a secretary. But the position may be seen as a stepping stone up the ladder and can offer an opportunity to be the most informed kindred in the city, outstripping even the harpies. Seneschal is one you need to deal with in order to get things done. An ambitious Seneschal who is well informed and who has the prince's ear and a prince who is often too busy with the cares of a large domain can be a lethal combination. The harpies are the gossip mongers, the rumor mills, the status givers. They are like the media and tabloids in the kindred society. Harpies are often of elder age or ancillae, but neonites are almost never, because they lack the knowledge and experience of the unlife's etiquette. Harpies demonstrate remarkable insight into both vampiric and human nature and can boast an unerring ability to see through pretense and pose. As most kindred are social creatures, especially the ones in the Camarilla, with the right word a harpy can ruin or venerate kindred's position in a city. The Keeper of Elysium is a job title that is self-descriptive. This kindred is responsible for everything that occurs in Elysium. He must ensure that every guest is received accordingly, that the masquerade is preserved at all times, that the location is safe from unwanted guests and enemies of the Camarilla. The job comes with heavy responsibilities and very few perks, and this position is the one to change hands frequently. Harpies turn immediately on a bad keeper. He often may offend somebody or get in the way of a sheriff's job, so a smart keeper knows when to resign. The sheriff position may vary from town to town, but his primary job is to be the prince's enforcer. Sheriff is the kindred responsible for policing the city, and during wartime he is often the war chief. With prince's approval, sheriff can select deputies who act fully in his authority. While Bruja and Gangrel may be the first choice for this position, Sheriff must also have some brain to his brawn. Keepers of Elysium and Sheriffs can be best friends or worst enemies, and Harpies can turn on each one if they can find a common ground when their responsibilities overlap. Some claim that the position of Scourge is a relic of medieval times, older form of the Sheriff, and others claim that it was created within the last decade. 
However it came to be, the Scourge is the office many Camarilla cities now possess. The Scourge scour the borderlands and barons of the cities and their targets are the fledgling vampires created without permission, anarchs, vampires of 14th and 15th generation also known as Timblots. Some princes grant Scourges the right of destruction and some demand that the Scourge brings his catch in for judgment. Some Scourges get overly enthusiastic about their right for destruction and end up attacking and killing vampires who have followed the protocol. These situations can create big problems for the prince so he needs to watch out not to elect some trigger happy kindred as his Scourge. The Scourges are often loners and if they are not the nature of their position eventually makes them one because many see them as dangerous and unnecessary, and most kindred don't feel comfortable around them. Not every kindred in the Camarilla has a title and is involved in its politics. Quite the contrary, many are just on the receiving end of it. But as long as they respect the traditions, they are generally free to do what they want. The fact that they are immortal, they need to find something to occupy their minds before the crushing ennui of the ages drives them mad. There are many ways kindred deal with their eternity. Some dabble with mortals, interfering themselves in art, business and corporations, while others avoid mortal society and find interest in the occult, rituals, vampiric philosophy, research, etc. The heart of Camarilla and the core of its strength is the collection of vampire clans who banded together, who have gathered not out of some sense of altruism, but because of safety in numbers and better chance of survival. To understand Camarilla one must know its clans and their relationships with one another. Originally seven, without the gangrel who left, there are now six clans. Bruja were once powerful kings and philosophers that ruled Carthage and now the apple has fallen far from the tree. With hallowed Carthage just a fading memory, Bruja have become the angry young kindred of the Camarilla. Elders take a more philosophical approach with the clan's direction and keep the younger ones in the Camarilla's fold. Younger Bruja kindred shun the holes of power and take more rebellious approach and more than a few end up joining the Anarch movement. Within the Camarilla, Bruja have relatively small pool in the upper hierarchy of the city, and there are very few Bruja princes. However, their strength and biggest influence is on the streets and ivory towers, so a surprising number of sheriffs and scourges come from this clan. Of all the clans, they have the strongest hold on mortal academia, and almost every member of the clan has some ideal towards his striving, although the way they approach their ideals individually is very different. Bruja are the most disorganized of the clans, shunning formal meetings and rather gathering with like-minded members. Their gatherings are called rants, and they are essentially open to all members of the Camarilla, except for the Tremere towards who Bruja don't hide any distaste. Their organization has a rough breakdown along the philosophical lines, and they tend to split into three different groups. Iconoclasts, who are younger, more anarchistic Bruja, and they represent the stereotypical image of the clan. Idealists, who are older members of the clan and are more interested in the ideals of the clan, and are scholars and philosophers. Needless to say, these two groups look down on one another. And then there are individualists who are stuck in the middle of both camps and catch flack from both sides. Bruja can't agree or find a unified policy on pretty much anything, because of their chaotic organizations and their attitudes towards each other and everybody else. Elders are still angry over Carthage and younger ones howl about venture oppression and selective law enforcement. The only thing that brings Bruja together is the issue of Sabbat. Streets is where the Sabbat operates and being that the streets are Bruja territory that is where the problem arrives. Bruja feel that they are used as cannon fodder against the Sabbat and they complain that they get little help from others. There is even a joke that circulates among other clans willing to fight to the last Bruja. But there will come a day, or rather a night, when the Bruja will just let the Antitribu through, although they are not there yet. Madman is a common description that others have for the members of the Malkavian clan. Malkavians are insane, but not in a way that everybody else imagines. Malkavians see the world through their cracked lens of perception, which outsiders dismiss as mere insanity. What exactly the Malkavians are doing in the Camarilla is a subject of some debate, but their allegiance to the sect has never wavered, 
although their interests with the sect's agenda seem to intersect only peripherally, and that has risen some disquieting suspicion about their real motives. There is no Malkavian organization, the clan simply is. There are rumors about the Malkavian Madness Network, through which they communicate telepathically, but no one outside of their clan has been able to confirm it. What do they want and what are they concerned about, no one knows. Malkavian claimed that by removing the scales of normal behavior they are able to see the true reality more clearly. The Malkavian custom that has the highest profile is the art of pranking or playing jokes on other kindred, so as to expand their perceptions. Of course these jokes are amusing only to them and the targets find them to be from annoying to fatal. Malkavians tend to embrace mortals who are outside of mainstream society. While not all are clinically insane before the embrace, none are paragons of stability. Their sires don't seem to be particularly attentive to their children, but somehow neonites end up knowing everything they need to know. That fact returns the speculation back to their madness network, but such theories are yawned off. Aside from their monstrous visage, Nosferatu are not monsters. They reside in sewers and filth and hiding behind illusions they seek any tidbit of information that appears worth having. Nosferatu deal in secrets and information is their currency. Their willingness to go places other kindred disdain serves them well on many occasions and their reputation as monstrous filters many unwanted visitors. While they do dwell within the city sewers, they are not restricted by them, because after all, all the action is above. Sewers are just a good place for privacy, of which they are very fond of, and a good place to hide and protect themselves from their enemies. Their lairs are full of intricate traps, so any intruder better be ready to pay the price for trespassing. It is rare for Nosferatu to hold position in the city government. Most kindred are uncomfortable around them and princes find ways to keep the Nosferatu out of power. Nosferatu prince is almost unheard of. But while they do avoid appointing Nosferatu in their government and Nosferatu don't seem to care about it, they do need them for their information. Nosferatu know that and they drive a hard bargain favors owed, gossip shared and new information dealt, amount to a remarkable influence for the clan. Nosferatu and afraid to use their knowledge in exchange for new, and many kindred have found themselves humiliated, blackmailed or even killed after letting the wrong word fall into Nosferatu hands. Nosferatu organization is loose but not non-existent. Regional collection of Nosferatu called broods gather on semi-regular basis to swap information. Meetings of broods are called hostings and are arranged when there is a need to exchange very important information and debate about important matters. In recent years they have invested in Shreknet, wiring brood to brood in cyberspace allowing for faster exchange of data. Nosferatu treat each other with a great deal of respect and they are the only clan who don't regularly grumble about their elders. This mutual respect ensures easy and fast dealings and ability to get things done. Nosferatu know too much to not be concerned. They know why Gangrel left the Camarilla, entirely too much of what goes between the Malkavians, what is really happening in the corridors of Venture Power and are less than sanguine about the Camarilla's future. Other concern to which others are not privy is for the Niktuku. According to the clan lore, Niktuku are their clan's founders' other children who are so twisted and monstrous that in comparison to them Nosferatu are pretty. Niktuku are enormously powerful, utterly hateful and hunt Nosferatu across the globe. A alarming number of Nosferatu burrows have gone silent and intelligence informed that Niktuku are on the move. To the Toriador beauty is as important as blood. These kindred are devoted to the exploration, creation and preservation of art in all its forms. Contrary to their image as self-indulging posers, they are among the most effective manipulators that Camarilla possesses. Masters of intrigue, they can make words sharper and more deadlier than Gangrel's claws. Their superhuman senses make them able to see through others' moods and anticipated actions and in combination with their vanity, they can make them very dangerous. Toreador are chasing excellence in artistry, but what some of them find artistic may be fatal to others. With all eternity before them, they have all the time to seek perfection, but they don't always seek it in ways and places that others can expect. Apart from Ventru, no other clan has adopted more thoroughly in the Camarilla than the Toreador. 
As a result, there is a fair share of Toreador as princes, sheriffs, seneschals and the like. However, there are few keepers of Elysium that hail from this clan, and the word is that they are too entranced by the exhibits and don't do their job properly. But through the ranks of the harpies, Toreador truly exercise their clout. Toreador harpies can make or break vampires' reputation in a matter of seconds. Toreador don't have formal organization, but rather a free-floating artist's collection called guilds. The clan can be broken into two groups, the artists and the posers. Artists are the truly creative among the Toreador, the ones who produce works of true inspiration and beauty. The others are those who are less talented. Most of the clan's concerns are internal, focused on nature of art and creativity and concerns of the Camarilla are merely political and transient. Unlike other clans, Toreador like gathering and they meet practically every week to swap gossip and debate art. Gatherings are called affairs of the clan and are vital for gaining prestige within the clan. The clan also has a formal meeting each month of the full moon and these meetings are called balls. They are open to all Toreador and outsiders can attend only by invitation. Such invitations are highly sought after because Toreador can throw one hell of a party. The Grand Ball is once a year, set for Halloween, completely Toreador specific and of utterly no interest to others. Once every 23 years, there is a week-long festival of the Toreador's true nature. There, Toreador choose the greatest mortal artists of their generation and reward them with embrace in order to forever preserve his artistry. Born in stolen blood and awash in it ever since, the Tremere are regarded with suspicion by their allies and utter hatred by their enemies. Ever since Tremere and his associates crossed the barrier between life and unlife, they have kept a kind of siege mentality. Because of their treacherous step into immortality, they have been constantly under attack and suspicion. They have never let their guards down and as a result over the centuries they have grown more insular and self-sufficient. Because of their situation, Tremere are concerned by two things, extinction and power. The Elder Warlocks have never forgotten the horrific war waged against them by the Zemitsi, when every hand was against them in the Carpathian Nights. They always fear that their enemies still wait for an opportunity to make vengeance. But the Zemitsi are not the only ones. Ventru, Toriador and escaped gargoyles also play their roles. And let's not forget the Salubri. Ever since Tremere diabolized Salubri, his children have been haunted by the fear of Salubri vengeance. Without a doubt, Tremere are the most highly structured of all clans, and their true power comes from the unified front they present. For them, clan always comes first. Attack on one Tremere is attack on all of them. That's not to say that there is no backstabbing and hate within the clan, but when the external threat appears, the warlocks luck step. Their organization is methodical and thorough. Based out of their chantry in Vienna, they have always held a process of slow expansion and consolidation. Once they acquire a chantry, they fortify and reinforce it and then move on with their expansion. Every Tremere has his own specific place and purpose in a clan's hierarchy. At the top there is the Council of Seven which is comprised of all fourth generation Tremere. Below sits the Order of Pontifices, seven of whom are assigned to each councillor. Each pontifex has a domain to oversee and has a direct authority over a group of seven lords called the Order of Lords. Each lord oversees a smaller geographic region and has seven regions reporting to him. And in the end each region has control over Tremere affairs in a particular chantry. Every neonite receives initiation as an apprentice of the first circle and reports to his regent every week. Furthermore, each neonite drinks a chalice of the mixed blood of the Council of Seven, bringing them closer to a full blood bond and securing their unison and loyalty. With all these regulation and indoctrinations, every Tamir clearly sees where they are supposed to be and for what reason. Of course, not every member follows the rules, but when found, punishment is swift and thorough. Tremere meet regularly on each level and devote themselves to forever expand their knowledge. Today, the other clans know less about what the Tremere actually do than they ever have, and the warlocks like it that way. The Ventru are the backbone of the Camarilla, and the clan most firmly committed to the ideal of the sect. They boast more princes than any other clan, and see participation in the Camarilla as a duty. 
always a clan of aristocracy, the Ventru are these days transitioning from embracing the hereditary elite to enfolding the financial and political elite instead, picking only creme de la creme out of the mortal world. The clan has always flocked towards power and seems to be their unifying trait. As a result, they have become firmly enmeshed in speculative markets, industry and other financial areas. They are aware of the power money has and through their enormous army of mortal pawns they use their power exceedingly well. Despite the clan's guise of gentility the clan adopts, the Ventru capacity for cruelty and rapacity is boundless. They may be polite, but they are ruthlessly efficient, burned with ambition and tirelessly dedicated. Ventru remain the most powerful clan in the Camarilla and in most Camarilla cities the local power structure is riddled with them. The clan has an exceedingly formal organization. The leadership of the clan, sometimes called the board of directors, has approximately 30 members across the globe, and their meetings are irregular but mandatory. Each city hosts a clan headquarters called the board and is run from gentlemen's club or expensive office spaces. The board doubles as a corporation and it is a tool through which the venture exercises their financial control on the local level. Everyone in the clan knows his place and the progress through the ranks for the younger vampires has little room and too much ambition and initiation is frowned upon by the elders. The venture concern is primarily with the Camarilla and how to preserve it, especially in the wake of gangrel defection because without them the Camarilla stands weakened. Within the Camarilla, the clan's greatest concern is the growing power of the Tremere who seem poised to wrest the command of the sect from the Ventru. Ventru are too nitpicky and have numerous formal practices and customs, but one of the most essential is that of an assistance. In all things clan come first, and by long tradition Ventru members are obliged to come to their clanmates aid regardless of personal risk or preference. One of the Ventru's greatest strengths is the depth of their interaction with the mortal world. They dabble in the mortal political and financial world like no other, and have the most skilled and most highly placed ghouls of all clans. Their expertise at using mortal tools is one of the keys to sect's continued survival. The Gangrel as a clan have formally seceded from the Camarilla, but that is not to say that every Gangrel has turned his back on the organization as whole, and there are many who consider themselves as part of the sect. The clan as a whole has withdrawn its support from the governing body, abandoning his right to have equal say and equal power in the sect's councils. However, the clan's elders attach no stigma to those individuals who choose to remain with the Camarilla. Those gangrel who have remained with the sect occupy a slightly reduced place in the sect's hierarchy and without the presence of a clan's justicar to defend the gangrel's interests, members of other clans are making subtle encroachments on the gangrel's territories. Even the Camarilla gangrel are solitary by nature and don't take much interest in the city's government. Most prefer moving from place to place or develop a concern about specific landscape over which territory they are ready to fight tooth and nail. The clan's departure from the Camarilla has left the remaining members weakened and there is enough gangrel left just to keep anyone from pushing them around. Having given up the representation in the inner circle and the right to present a justice card, the gangrel are now without a voice at the highest level of power and are feeling the consequences. Remaining gangrel are not so much organized as they are stable and their gatherings are called by whoever sees a need for it. The clan members are not very interested in the city's politics and occupy the positions with less rigid responsibilities such as sheriffs and scourges. A higher than expected number of gangrel have taken the mantle of Archon, possibly because the job's nomadic nature and mandate to circumvent politics appeals to their sensibilities. While not formal, gangrel have customs with strict ritualization. Their gatherings are called all things which occur on the equinoxes and there they tell tales and deeds. Members are expected to remember what is told there and to pass on the important and interesting tales to other gangrel not in attendance. Gangrel follow the rule of the strongest and precedence at these meetings is determined by a series of individual contests for dominance. The primary concern that the most Camarilla Gangrel have is unsurprisingly the worry that the whole thing is going to come crashing down any night, and their focus is on their survival. The Camarilla by its definition speaks for and includes all kindred. 
Needless to say, this claim is ignored or mocked by the members of the Sabbat and independent clans. However, individuals who fall between the cracks, vampires whose allegiances would seem to lie elsewhere, or for one reason or another, have gathered under Camarilla's banner. There is a variety of clans and bloodlines that have joined Camarilla, and while Camarilla mandates that these individuals are granted the same treatment as any other kindred, their origins inevitably provide cause for suspicion and ill treatment. This is not to say that every Camarilla vampire whose blood doesn't trace back to the organization's original clans is treated poorly. More than a few have risen in power and status to the point where they are feared and respected throughout the Camarilla. To say that the Settites of the Camarilla are regarded as odd is an understatement. However, the handful of serpents who did heed the initial call of the Camarilla seem entirely sincere in their attachment to the sect. And even more bizarre is the fact that independent followers of Seth don't seem to take any steps to wipe these individuals out. What are the true agendas of these individuals and how does that comply with their clan's ultimate goal is a matter of some debate. These Settites keep a low profile and do their utmost for the sect as a method of working towards their clan's final aspiration. It is only in these modern nights that the Daughters of Cacophony have truly earned their name. They don't have males within their ranks and the reasons are unknown. Camarilla's daughters seem to belong in the sect out of convenience and not conviction. They are not interested in sect's politics nor any city's governance and are wholeheartedly interested only in music in all its forms. The Samedi of the Camarilla are a curious lot. Solitary by nature, they bounce from city to city looking for contract work for highly ranked Camarilla officials. Camarilla Samedi are with the organization for a number of reasons. They dislike Sabbat tactics and Camarilla offers reasonable protection and sometimes just better pay on this side of the fence. They often work as bodyguards for princes and archons and for that reason their presence in the city is accepted. Their repulsive corpse-like appearance and reputation keeps other kindred away and off balance which makes their job more easier. Esamites see the Camarilla as a source for work and nothing more. Their loyalty is to the clan first and foremost. Camarilla's tradition offer Esamites little ground for compromise, but they are happy to work for Camarilla vampires, although only as independent contractors. Zimitsi in the Camarilla is an incredibly rare thing. The very presence of Tremere in the sect guarantees that the Zimitsi have no interest in signing on. Those few who have joined with the Camarilla have done so for intensely personal reasons, but even under these circumstances they don't advertise their presence, don't take part in the sect politics and tend not to stick around when their personal objectives are accomplished. Sabat La Sombra denied the existence of the anti-tribal traitors, and while these individuals see themselves as La Sombra nothing more or nothing less. Philosophically, Camarilla La Sombra differ little from their Sabbat compatriots on a basic level. They still want to win the Jihad, they just see the Camarilla as a more effective tool for doing so. The position of these self-exiled kindred is an ambiguous one. Anti-tribal La Sombra are creatures of undeniable power and presence and are devoted to the destruction of Sabbat in a way that few kindred are. Camarilla cannot afford to waste their talents and knowledge of the enemy, but cannot afford to trust them entirely either. Majority of the La Sombra anti-tribu are older than the Camarilla itself and are the ones who joined with Montano and his choice to turn his back on his clanmates. As a result, they are a first target of any Sabbat pack in any given city and a mere rumor of their presence will drive local Sabbat La Sombra into homicidal frenzy. There are two distinct types of La Sombra anti-tribu. The old ones, who are the majority, and young angry ones, of remarkably low generation for canines so new to the blood, who are the children of the aged, vengeful ones. Seduced and abandoned by their sires, the caitiff are everywhere on the fringes of Camarilla society. Clanless and unwanted, they are the result of one-night stands, infatuations, frenzied embraces and outright mistakes. Stumbling along the haze of a new existence, few have a recollection of their sires, but eventually have discovered the keys of survival. Their only identifying mark is the lack of the same. 
Katif filled the position of second-class citizens in the politics of the Camarilla, and while some scorn active participation in it, others gladly seize any opportunity as a toehold in the establishment. But the main number of them avoid involvement out of self-preservation, preferring to have putative benefits of the membership in the Camarilla without being drawn into the politics. Caitiffs often flock together, forming coteries out of necessity and for defense, but groups of the clanless tend to have short life expectancies, shattering, fragmenting and reforming on a regular basis. There are many small bloodlines and individual clan members that have found themselves a place in the Camarilla, but are so rare that the knowledge of them is obscure and almost entirely based on rumors. Stay close by because soon there will be a second part. In the meantime, like, share and subscribe so that we could spread the darkness together. And remember, don't fear the dark, but find power in it.